Hi, this is The Philosophical Angle, and I'm your host, Chris Angle. I'm the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Philosophical Equations of Economics. And uh, these books are free for viewing online at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me are the panelists, Mark Brennan, professor at the Stern School of Business at New York University. He is also the American editor of the Quarterly Review of London, established 1809. Also, Rick Samuelson, graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton and an MA from Tufts, and he is retired from the investment banking industry. Welcome, guys. Thank you. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the concepts and topics in current media. And we'll offer explanation of these essences. This week, the subject of, of concept, the concept of uh, discussion will be the Volcker Rule. And for that, I've taken an ar article from the New York Times uh, by Louis Uchitel called The Glass-Steagall versus the Volcker Rule. I'm going to read most of the article, and uh, because the article has uh, some good background information about it, and then we'll discuss the Volcker Rule, which is in the news recently, uh, due to the uh, trading at the Morgan Stanley uh, desk in London. Okay, so um, we'll begin. F the Glass-Steagall versus the Volcker Rule. For the second time in less than 80 years, the nation's commercial banks are being told to stick to their knitting. Their knitting is taking deposits, handling checking accounts, lending money, and managing the nation's payment system. Twice now, they have ventured beyond these standard activities, gotten into trouble, and almost brought down the financial system. The solution in the 1930s, and once again now, is this. Get out of the sideline businesses that caused so much trouble. Those sidelines were different in the 1930s than they are now. Carter Glass, a congressman who was half the namesake of what has now been known as the Glass-Steagall Act, the Bank, the Banking Act, Act of 1933, forever known as Glass-Steagall, in the recognition of its sponsors, Senator Carter Glass and Representative Henry Steagall, required banks to spin off or shut down their brokerages and investment operations. These operations had lost huge sums in the 1929 stock market crash and in the earlier years of the Depression. The banks, for example, would underwrite corporate stock offerings, and if they had trouble selling the stock, they would buy it with money drawn from depositors' accounts, sometimes without depositors' knowledge. Or, as William Donaldson, a former chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, put it in an interview, if they were underwriting a stock offering and had trouble getting rid of the stuff, they would buy it with people's deposits. The restrictions imposed by Glass-Steagall kept bank deposits and banks themselves at a, at a safe distance from the markets. But that distance gradually shrank, and in the heady free market days of the late 1990s, Glass-Steagall itself was formally revoked. So commercial banks, the big ones at least, returned to the Wall Street marketplace. This time they got into trouble by in engaging in proprietary trading, that is the buying and selling of securities for their own account, particularly subprime mortgages packaged as bonds. When the market crashed in 2008, the federal government bailed out the banks and now the president is asking Congress to bar banks from proprietary trading. 
The president is acting on a proposal that Paul Volcker, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, has been pushing for months. It is sometimes referred to as Glass-Steagall in spirit, but the behavior involved and the proposed solution are different enough for the legislation to have its own name. And the Obama and Obama himself has suggested one, the Volcker Rule. So I'd like to ask our panelists whether the U.S. government should go forth with the Volcker Rule, which is an upshot from the Dodd-Frank uh, bill, along with its regulations. What do you think, guys? I'll, uh, anybody want to uh, venture forth? Mark? I think it's kind of ironic that somebody named Louis Ushitel, Ushitel means teacher in Russian, wrote an article that I learned absolutely nothing from. But I guess if you're a typical New York Times reader who's too busy uh, you know, going to Obama fundraisers and doing those sort of other silly things, a uh, short history primer like that might be of some value, no value to me. But I, the one thing that I will say in regard to the Glass-Steagall and Clinton's virtual abolition of it is that we are now paying the price uh, because of its abolition through the Republican Party who in October of 2008 decided that they would force upon the banks under the guise of a bailout a $125 billion TARP uh, program and do everything that they claim they wouldn't do. Even though they are this stupid party and they prove it time and time again, one would have thought that they would let failing businesses fail. Instead, they let the rent, they let the rent seekers of Wall Street manipulate them yet again and dole out corporate welfare to their constituency, which is corporate America. Okay. Okay. Rick, uh, any opening Rick, remarks? Uh, well, I, well I, I have a certain thing with glass steagle. Glass steagle. Rick, if you could uh, just uh, sit back from your microphone a little bit, please. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I have, a, I have a certain possibility with glass steagle, but to some extent, uh, the derivatives market, particularly the OTC market, uh, is so large that regulating it somehow needs to be addressed. As far as Scott Frank is concerned, uh, it will not prevent another financial industry. That is clear. And, and the reason is the regulations in their current form, they're not completely formulated, mind you, are focused on the wrong thing. The Volcker Rule in particular is focusing on the wrong problem. That is uh, alleged prop trading, you know, manic prop trading in the investment banks. That's not, That's what, not brought what brought the investment, investment banks down. down. What, brought what brought the investment, the investment banks down, down was attempting to hedge positions, positions that were, were extremely, extremely levered and failing, and failing to do so. And what that tells me is that the key issues in terms of now that we're now pregnant, that we're pregnant. Now, that now that we've taken the steps step to guarantee, guarantee these, these financial institutions, which, which is something, is something we can argue about, about quite separately and, separately and should be and argued about. about. But now that now we've that taken we the position as a country of guaranteeing, guaranteeing these large, large investment, investment banks, banks, we now we have, have to have deal with the situation as it is. And the two keys to that are one, oh, bringing as much of the OTC, the OTC business, business onto exchanges, onto exchanges so there's so some there's transparency, some and two, two, associating gap requirements, requirements with the gross, gross positions, positions that, these that these firms take. take. Not the net, the, net, the gross, gross positions, positions because, because derivatives, derivatives alone, alone represent a form of leverage. leverage. That's, That's why, why the losses, losses were so were great. So great. Okay. Okay. Um, 
All right. Now, but I would think that there are two problems with that uh, foc that we should focus on for the vocal rule. One, whether it should be instituted uh, in in as a whether it should be instituted to not allow the banks in the investment banking industry at all, or whether it should just be uh, not allowing the investment banks to have uh, access to clients' money. Obviously, it should not have access to clients' money. But whether uh, investment banks should be allowed, and banks themselves, having a, a, an investment bank subsidiary or, 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 or uh, uh, to be allowed to trade on, uh, on their own account with their own money, what do you think? Is one, is one just enough? In other words, is just the regulation or just the law or just a, uh, a reimposition of, of uh, the Glass-Steagall to uh, not the entire uh, 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 effect of it, which separates the investment bank from the bank itself, but uh, just the uh, portion where it can trade its own money, but it just can't trade uh, the money of, the, uh, of, of any depositors. Chris, the, the, the problem is that money is fungible, and when you put your money in a bank, it doesn't go into a cubby hole, it just goes into a big uh, pot. And when a bank is levered, commercial banks are levered, you know, 12 to 15 times on their equity base. Investment banks are levered anywhere from 20 to, they're running 60 times their equity base right before the crash. When these things go down, the slightest change to the asset base, you know, on that small of an equity base just wipes out the equity base, and that takes down your deposits or clients' money or whatever else it is with it, because these things are just pure leverage. So the fantasy that we can take your savings and stick them in a cubby hole and you'll be safe uh, exists only in the minds of, of silly Americans who want to believe it or who think that the $200,000 government guarantee on their deposits uh, will be something that the government will be able to stand by. The government will be able to stand by it, but if it ever comes to the point where they're doing massive bailouts with that $200,000 limit, they'll be doing it with an inflated currency that when you receive it, it won't be, the only thing it'll be useful for is to wipe your backside after you have a bowel movement. Well, um, <laughs> uh, thanks for, uh, uh, I, I agree with you and I, 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 um, I think that's probably why, uh, probably, it may be true that the segmentation of clients' funds from the bank in itself, um, but you know, a bank makes various types of, uh, of um, transactions. They can also have a loan portfolio, and that in itself is a kind of judgment that they have to use and accept the risk that they have to take in judging the uh, the uh, the. The amount of risk that they that they have in their portfolios, because people come and businesses come to the bank and 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 with their and apply for uh, their loans, and they come with a risk involved. So is that risk any different from uh, buying or selling on, on a proprietary uh, trading desk? Uh, certain risks. It just seems that the product is different, uh, not the risk. Uh, what do you think, guys? Rick, I hope you heard that better than I did. I, I, I couldn't, I hear, couldn't it hear that well. That well, I, I'd like, to, I'd like comment to comment on, on the deposit on insurance, insurance uh, situation. Uh, it, seems it seems to me, to me as long as, as, long as this blanket like guarantee, guarantee for the, for the quote unquote, too big, too big to, fail, to fail institutions is in place, place we should probably, we should probably actually, actually remove, remove deposit, deposit insurance. insurance guarantee for all those banks because what we would actually like to do is have depositors move from those okay I agree you know uh, but the uh, fe uh, being a uh, a member of the Federal Reserve doesn't permit you to uh, to do that. You'd have to change the rules on which you uh, mem banks or are, are members of the Federal Reserve because in order uh, in order to make uh, in order to be a part of the Federal Reserve, you have to abide by its rules, and um, uh, otherwise you can't deal with any banks in the Federal Reserve. So uh, if you if you 
take yourself away from its rules and that which one of which would be the FDIC, then you would not be able to deal with uh, any Federal Reserve banks in the future. Uh, you'd have to change that rule also then. Um, so, uh, but I'd like to get really back to the Volcker rule as a whole. I think that I think that the Volcker rule should not be instituted. Only a regulation or only a law stating that you cannot uh, use the depositors' funds. Now, I know Mark pointed out that that's an impossibility. Um, I, I think it is possible. You can always take uh, the capital uh, and segment it. For the, the working capital of the corporation can be segmented out, and you can make it with, uh, with uh, uh, severe laws of, of, uh, of touching uh, clients' funds um, and, and using that for proprietary trading reasons. I, uh, just, just, like at MF, just like at MF Global. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, just, I, I, just, I, that's right. And uh, it's a just good. Like, just like at the prime, bro the prime brokerage clients of Lehman Brothers in London, you would think that these are totally segregated assets off on their own. When Lehman went bankrupt, prime brokerage assets, so assets owned by hedge funds that were just being kept on a custodial basis by Lehman Brothers in London, hedge funds were not allowed to touch those assets because they got sucked down in the bankruptcy. So. If you think that bankruptcy law means anything to this administration or its predecessor or its successor, who are going to be equally as uh, hubristic as to just discard bankruptcy law and not worry about anything in a crisis because anything will do, you're living in a fantasy land. When the you know what hits the fan, assets got locked up, assets go poof. And we're dealing with a whole new problem, which is what the government ultimately wants. Because the more problems there are that only supposedly only the government can solve, then they accrue more power. But remember, Chris, um, they keep saying never let a, cri good, a crisis go to waste. And that's both parties, both the evil party, the Democrats, and the stupid party, the Republicans. OK. Um. So uh, from what I, I, I think I'm going to infer from uh, uh, your statement, Mark, that it's an impossibility to separate the funds of, uh, of a depositor with the working capital of the, uh, of the investment bank. Is that, is that uh, pretty much the conclusion here? Yeah, I, I think, if in, I think if, if in August of 2008 you had said, um, What's the probability that a secured creditor lending money to Chrysler will be, tell, be told to go jump in a lake if right. Chrysler were to have trouble? Um, I think that all three of us would have said, I'll bet my net worth that they would never yeah, step yeah. on the toes. The government would never step on the toes of a secured, a secured creditor of Chrysler. And guess what happened, Chris? In a crisis, it, it all goes out the window. You know, it's almost like the rule of law goes out the window. Uh, these radical revolutionaries in the, in, in the evil party are looking for events like this so they can take bankruptcy law and just crumble it up and just blow their nose in it and flush it down the toilet and rewrite the rules and regulations. This is like the French Revolution being done in the financial markets. The only thing we're missing is a guillotine. They don't they believe, don't believe in, in private property. property. Right, right. Of course, why, why would we have private property? That, you know, we're looking, we're, Rick, we're ultimately striving for equality. If you have more property than I do, then we're not equal and we've lost our entire the one-third of the revolution of egalite. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so uh, okay. let's assume so, that. So Chris, we got, we, got to, we got to get off the cubbyhole idea. Let's, 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 let's talk about what might be an effective solution. I think Rick actually, actually had a good thing. There's also uh, you know, another way to fund these companies in such a way. Have them uh, you know, issue contingent convertible uh, preferred equity where uh, that would be highly dilutive as we started to approach a crisis situation. So instead of, you know, where right now it's a binary process where everything's humming along and then bankrupt, instead, as we approach it, as we approach a problem, this preferred stock would convert to equity and totally dilute the shareholder base, which would annoy all the shareholders and get these guys voted out of, voted out of their sinecures. Okay. okay. I'm talking about the corporate management. Yeah, I understood. Yeah. Uh, by, by the way, you know, the, 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 I don't know what prompted this discussion. I'm guessing it's the JP Morgan thing, but suddenly losing money is now about to become uh, you know, illegal. J.D. Morgan lost $2 billion on a $127 billion equity base. They made $19 billion last quarter. 
This is a perfect example of the government um, acting like a demagogue. This is no different from Joe McCarthy. The, the circumstances are different, and the, the, you know, the, the underlying issue is different. But this is Joe McCarthy. This $2 billion loss, that's a normal part of doing business. The only thing the government did right in the last five years in, in regards to the financial crisis is to let Lehman go down the toilet. Instead, they were humped. There, everyone was howling and screaming about these companies are too big to fail, too big to fail. What do we have now? Well, what they did was they made them all jump in bed together. So now we have Bank of America, which also includes Merrill Lynch. We have Wells Fargo, which now includes um, Wachovia, which was First Union. We have all these companies now together. Now, not only are they too big to fail, they're too big to bail. So when these things collapse, we're going to have an even bigger problem than we had last time. So my one recommendation would be enjoy it because by then the 16.98 trillion dollar debt cap we're going to blow through that and it's going to be off to the races well i agree with you uh, uh rick yeah well i, well, I, I go I back go first 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 to the sale of which trials i think i think I think, I think uh, the Obama uh, administration, the administration is targeting Jamie Diamond, Diamond, Diamond because, because he, he has, has an extremely good reputation for his management, management, so they have, so they to, have take to take him take down. down. Yep. Yeah, God, you know, God help it if one guy actually navigated his way through the crisis, you know, this guy has to be brought under control. We can't have any free thinkers. We can't have anybody who has success in the markets. Everyone must be underneath Obama and his administration's thumb. We can't have any, any, not a single independent mind out there or independent actor. What, until the government has complete totalitarian control of the markets, they will continue this, this Salem witch trial. Well, that's interesting, you know, but I want to bring up one thing about uh, uh, remarks from both of you that you've uh, uh, talked about the uh, governments coming in to uh, take away the rights of asset owning members such as your, 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 uh, uh, the Chrysler uh, bondholders, um, which seems to me to lead to a conclusion that you want less government interference, but the Volcker rule is more government interference. Um, and my own uh, feeling on this is that the Volcker Rule is part of regulation, and regulations uh, preclude the forming of economic activity. Uh, tax law uh, operates on the result of... of of the we, 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 we're, we're, only, we're only discussing the Volcker Rule, and we're only, the Volcker Rule is only being proposed for one reason. It's to fix previously bad regulation and previously b bad government interference. So, for instance, are we talking about imposing the Volcker Rule on Lehman Brothers? No, we're not, because Lehman Brothers doesn't exist anymore. If you let the market function, if you let companies go out of business and lose money, then you don't need to be discussing the Volcker Rule, which is making up for idiotic things like deposit insurance and all these other, uh, all these other ideas that the government imposed on these companies. Let the market decide who should exist and who shouldn't. Uh -huh. Let these companies go down. The one problem is when they create the externality of going bankrupt and losing a lot of people a lot of money. But we've all become very complacent. Nobody looks at the balance sheet. Every, we, everyone goes up to the bank house, sticks their money in the bank. Does anyone look at the balance sheet of that bank before they do that? No, of course not, because you've been lulled into complacency by the deposit insurance rules. So why bother? Why, why should you as a depositor, why should you care? When you hear that your bank is making you know, no money down, no income, no document, 125% uh, LTV mortgages to people of no, you know, who, who arrived in this country 15 minutes ago, sure, go put your deposit there. A sane person would say, I'm not going to be the, the, the person who's funding these moronic loans, but when you have a $100,000 insurance policy from the government, why not? You've got nothing to lose. So the Volcker Rule, we're just playing whack-a-mole. The Volcker Rule is the latest one to fix regulations that did not work before. Okay, so if okay. I can uh, summarize I, what I think is your conclusion or what you're uh, uh, looking to do here would be to uh, not have a Volcker Rule, not have a Glass-Steagall, uh, let the marketplace solve uh, all its problems uh, without, uh, with, with little or no regulation. Is, is, is that conclu the conclusion we can... Uh... Absolutely, absolutely minimal regulation. You know, we've got, we've, got a, we've got volumes full of laws. You know, I flew down to Miami this weekend on American Airlines, which is bankrupt. It was a great trip, had a great experience. The bankruptcy laws in this country work. They're a great thing, but we just don't use them because we're afraid. Because 
Why use them when you can grab power instead? You know, Rahm Emanuel is probably doing it on a smaller scale now in Chicago, but Obama is still doing it. Okay. okay. Rick, I'd uh, like to get some final, uh, final uh, thoughts on whether uh, your feeling on whether the imposition of the Volcker rule uh, in the sense that I think, I, think, I, think, I think the Volcker rule is a red herring because it's framed in a way such that it identifies the wrong problem, namely that banks are allegedly, you know, like hedge funds, just uh, doing highly leveraged trades to try to make a quick buck here and there. That's not actually how investment banks work. The amount of prop trading they do as a percentage of their asset base is very small, and a lot smaller now than it used to be. So it's the wrong role to attack the wrong problem. Uh, and it's, it's what's tragic is it's getting too much attention. This discussion gets attention to the exclusion of the real issues. Okay. Yeah, Chris, I mean, this is, we see this in every military engagement, too. The generals are always fighting the last war, and here it is in the financial markets. Right. right. Okay. okay. Guys, I want to thank you for thank participating. You. And, uh, and I want to thank the audience for visiting us on The Philosophical Angle, and we'll see you next week. Thank you very much.